Well, good evening, everyone. We're glad that uh, glad that you're here. Glad that you chose to uh, to be with us. If you're visiting, we are certainly glad that you're here. And I ask that you stay around for a few moments that we can uh, get to know you and perhaps find out if we can serve you in some way. Also, if you're visiting, you'll notice uh, on the seat back in front of you some visitor's cards. And if you're willing, please uh, fill one of those out and pass it toward the center aisles. The ushers will be by in just a few moments to, uh, to pick those up. The next time of service will be midweek Bible study at 7 o'clock, and we hope that, that you choose to be with us. Uh, just uh, you may notice some weather moving through in the next uh, Tim had the, the radar up as we were walking down some weather moving through and uh, we're monitoring that and uh, if they need to break in or make any kind of announcements uh, they'll they'll do that but that should be just a few minutes you'll see it kind of kind of get a little active but they're they're watching it a little bit of, a, of an update uh, Miss Betty is maybe by now moved out of the room or in the process of moving out of uh, uh, ICU or SICU into room 491 uh, kind of uh, hold back on the visitors tonight let her get settled and then tomorrow uh, clear to uh, to go see sister Betty so so room 491 and that's kind of happening as as we speak don't forget to get uh, one of the the prayer sheets or the, the sick list that's right outside the uh, the table the doors on the table and please use that uh, during the week as a as a reminder because you don't have a, a, a bulletin, I'll, I'll run down and, and recount some of what we talked about this morning. Uh, Basil, Cecilia, uh, David Robinson we talked about had some uh, reactions to the med medication. Virginia Sanders, Jimmy and Regina are about to have uh, some surgery, so, so please continue to remember them. From California, uh, news on Sister Annie. Annie has been, Annie, Sister Annie Ruth has been having some problems with her back lots of pain uh, some decreased mobility she's she's frustrated uh, because of that uh, please keep her in your prayer so please pray for sister Annie Ruth um, tonight and this week also tonight after services all the ladies going to the retreat uh, just I guess meet down front would be uh, the best thing uh, John you will uh, will come in and, and find you down front but anyway she wants to meet with everyone uh, tonight. Also, don't forget service teams to rotate your uh, folders for the college students, the two students that each service team sponsors uh, each month. Push those to the next higher number, whatever students you had. Last leaders, all the mass media entries need to, entries need to be turned in next Sunday. That's the latest. Please turn into Brother Rob Lenore all the uh, mass media entries. The final Good Samaritan points are also due by next Sunday. Ushers, if you'll uh, please pick up any cards, please. The team going to the Honduras, they need to, uh, to you need to remember that the deposits are due today. So if you have any questions or issues with that, uh, please see uh, Patty, Butch, Michael, or, or Beth. Our first song is going to be song number 575. 575. Our opening prayer will be by Brother Rick Presnell and our closing prayer by Brother Steve Hartless. Brother Rick comes. Our Father, as we come before you tonight, we are truly grateful for this opportunity to, to meet with our family here at Maisel. We're grateful for the, the love that's evident here, for the love that we feel for each other. Father, may we show that love to the neighborhood and the world, because that's how the people will really know that we're Christians. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, for the opportunity of coming to you in, in prayer, bringing to you the petitions of our hearts. Father, we are thankful to you for the news that Sister Betty is moving on into a regular room. We, we pray that you will be with her and help her to recover. Father, we thank you for the many that have been sick, that have recovered, that are on their way to recovery. And we also ask you to be with those that are still struggling with illnesses. Father, we pray your prayers upon us tonight as we worship, your, worship you, as we sing songs to you. May we turn our minds and our hearts to truly worship you in spirit and in truth. 
Father, we thank you for the congregation that meets here, for each member, for what they mean to the community. Father, we thank you for the leadership we have here, for the elders that we have, for the many years they've put into overseeing us. May we always look to them and, and realize the, the great burden that's placed upon them and try to make that easier. Father, we're also grateful to you for those that are ministers here, for Tim and Hunter and Lonnie. We thank you for the talents that they bring to this congregation and for their ability to bring your word to us. Father, we pray for our brother Lonnie tonight as he brings this message to us. May we listen to it attentively and figure out that he's bringing things to us from your word that we can apply to our lives and to make ourselves better Christians. Father, we thank you once again for your love, for your sacrifice of your son. Be with us as we worship tonight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Five hundred seventy-five. Stormy weather, of course, tonight may be a little appropriate, but uh, there's other challenges in life that come along. We know that God is a refuge, whatever they are. Let's take the first and last stanzas, please. <coughs> the Lord's our rock in first and last stanzas. <clears throat>
843, 843. Do the first and second on this, please. 843. <clears throat> As Number 360.
763, mark that hymn, we'll sing it after the lesson, 763. And now 737, 737. To the first and the last. If you'd like to, please stand. We'll sing it together. <clears throat> Christ our Redeemer died on the cross, died for the Lonnie comes to deliver the message for this evening. I want to take just a few minutes to uh, present the budget that we've adopted for uh, 2013. Um, I think you can see from the number of um, people we've had to come give reports in the last six months or so how much involvement we have in mission work. There's a lot that, that I can stand here and tell you about as far as the budget, but to sort of summarize it in, in a manner that um, makes the most of our time tonight, we, we still have to do things to turn the lights on and uh, keep the building going. We still have to take care of uh, the um, Bible school materials that we have in our classrooms. Uh, we still have to maintain the building that we, that we have, pay for insurance for our vehicles, and on and on the, the list of things go that we have to take care of year after year. Some of that increases uh, in cost, and as you might imagine, because you experience that in your own lives. And so we have to take care of that, but our, our main emphasis uh, is taking care of the congregation here and to make sure that we are doing what we can do to spread the gospel throughout uh, this country and throughout the world. So. When we talk about our budget, there's a, a big emphasis in mission work, and we've always had that at Maysville. That's one thing that I think from a reputation standpoint we have been about, and we continue to do that, and, and I think that's where we need to have our, our emphasis. Uh, a local uh, work to try to reach the community that which we live in, and uh, this country, at the opportunities that we have, and also for those things that are abroad, and so we've tried to to make sure that we find good works, sound works, and that the money is properly spent. So tonight, we, as we talk about that, there's going to be the main emphasis to talk about the mission work that we have, because the rest of it is pretty constant. Um, we have made some adjustments. Uh, you'll see from time to time we do some maintenance here at the building. Uh, the new kitchen that was remodeled this past year, and uh, we're enjoying and things of that nature uh, to keep us dry and, and out of the rain like we're having tonight. Uh, these things are important, 
but uh, and we want to make sure we take care of those but they that's not where our real emphasis is we we will take care of those things um, this year if, if you look at what we we've, we've tried to do this past year um, we we've, we've um, acquired the services of hunter and we we appreciate the job he's doing and with our young people and uh, along with the other ministers who continue to, to help us grow and to help us to get a greater knowledge of God's Word. We appreciate what they do for us. And um, we're just trying to, to do the best that we can and, and to, to move on and do what God wants us to do. As we look at the mission world that we um, are trying to be actively engaged in, uh, we have a number of activities through television, uh, through radio and through evangelists that are in various locations throughout the world. Um, this year, there's some areas that we're going to um, try to increase our activity in. We are going to be involved in a Tanzania mission teamwork that will be starting in July of this year. And so we budgeted some additional uh, monies for that this starting this year. There's a work in New York that we've been aware of since last year. We've been, um, we, we know of its soundness. We know that it's a good work. We, uh, we, we made an effort to budget that into our uh, budget this year so that we could help some people up there be able to maintain uh, the preaching of the gospel. And that's, that's an area that really, uh, in this whole country, the areas that need it, and that's just one that we've been made aware of and we know it's a good sound work. We've uh, picked up supporting the uh, the Dasco Children's Home in Honduras. We, we've been involved in Honduras every year for the last several years. It's, it's a good work. We know what's going on over there. We know that the proper uh, things are being taught and people are being uh, reached with the gospel and children are certainly a, a great avenue. If you saw this morning what Gary Reeves presented to us, these children are an avenue to learn and obey the gospel and possibly bring their parents and uh, other members of their family to the to the truth so we're we're going to continue to support those kinds of activities um, so these are some of our new works that we're adding this year and so our, it increases our our missionary budget and this is where our main emphasis is this year and of course we have a number of things that we're involved in uh, trying to support uh, additional funds for the gospel chariot, the third one in northern Africa, and uh, trying to support the Nevis work to, to uh, complete a building over there so that they can continue to meet and have a place that they can um, have to bring people to, to to hear the gospel preached. So there are a number of things that we're doing, and um, we we want to make you aware of some of these things and to let you know that they're in, in our budget and we're going to be increasing that. Now we put a budget out each year uh, to try to challenge the congregation. There are things that we have been able to accomplish. And when you, and as any activity in life, when you show that you can reach a certain milestone, then for us to continue growing, we think that we need to be challenged to, to do more. We're not just trying to see how much money we can ask for. We're trying to see what we can do that God wants us to do. And so this year our, our budget is certainly, uh, as it has been every year, going to be increased. And we, we have gone from uh, last year's budget of $10,516 uh, that we need on a weekly basis to this year uh, requesting that you support us in being able to uh, contribute $12,177 a week. Now that's an increase of, of over $1,600. And, and that's, that's significant. But we, we, I believe we have the congregation size-wise and the ability to, uh, to do that. And certainly we want to try to, to, to make that happen. So we put that out there to challenge you. And, and uh, for your consideration, we'd like for you to, to uh, support that and let us be able to continue the kinds of works that we've been doing and, and quite evidenced by the, the speakers who've come and told us uh, recently of what they've been able to accomplish. Um, if we don't support these people, the work's not going to get done. It, we're not going to be able to reach lost souls, and, and that's what we should be about here and, and abroad. And, and the efforts that, that are being made are made possible 
because of generosity of, of brethren uh, in congregations such as this. So we challenge you for that as a new, new budget. We know it's a, a significant increase, but we think we're certainly capable of doing that and we, we uh, solicit your support in doing that. So uh, if you have any questions about that, we can, can try to answer some of those, but I just want to make you aware of it and this is what we're going to move forward with for, for this year, 2013. Lonnie. You want to open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, we'll read a short verse there and maybe look at some other things. This is only the second Sunday of 2013. I feel like it's been 2013 a long time. I don't know why I feel like it's been a new year for so long, but this is only the second Sunday in the new year, and this is my first opportunity to talk uh, in the new year. And I knew this was going to be a budget night, and we're going to be talking about some, some newer things. And I thought it would be a good time to spend a little time talking about my transition and what we envision for our family ministry here at Maysville. It's not uncommon for a youth minister to become a family minister. That happened to me at Memorial Parkway. I became from the youth to the youth and family minister, and that's kind of been my role now as the family minister here. And when you hear the term family ministry, it should have two meanings for everybody in the building. Number one, it, it, it's about our families. I try to be very enmeshed with this Life Builders group and spend my time at service teams and different things with their activities, but also want to be involved with the people who have teenagers, want to be involved with the people who have uh, smaller children. I almost use a youth ministry term, call them rugrats and curtain climbers, and I've got to be more professional now. But uh, we're going to be involved in our children's ministry, but also the term family ministry means the church family as a whole. So if you hear an event that says we're having a family ministry activity, don't think, well, I'm a single or I'm retired or we don't have any young kids. When we talk about family ministry, we're talking about not just the nuclear family, but the congregational family so that we can do some things. As, as part of this new ministry, we just did a series on marriage, on having healthy marriages. I'll be taking that seminar on the road some. Uh, we'll be doing every Wednesday night in August at the Flint Church of Christ. Uh, I'll be doing a uh, parenting seminar every Wednesday night for a month uh, in Winchester. But uh, we did a, a series of just lessons on, the, on marriage in the fellowship hall. Right now on Wednesday nights, we're doing a series of lessons for men. We're doing just a men's ministry and a men's group. We're meeting in the... Uh, we were in the puppet room last time. We went into three different rooms before we found our home. We're in the puppet room uh, for, for that. And then uh, one of the activities we're going to do as a family ministry is every fifth Sunday. We've talked with Cecil. We've talked with the elders. We've talked with the Life Builders group. And every time there's a fifth Sunday, we'll have the fourth Sunday fellowship every fourth Sunday. But then every time there's a fifth Sunday, we're going to have another activity. It could be a devotional. It could be a... Uh, a, a sit down and eat thing. It may just be an activity, but it will be an intergenerational function. It'll be for everybody with children all the way up to our senior citizens where we come together as a congregational family and do some specialized activities and some specialized focus on our work as a family. When you think about involving families, and the thing, and we'll probably do our, our summer Bible study series. We'll, we'll change that format a little bit to make sure it has more of appeal to be a, an eclectic group, some in the summer. But when you think about families, as, as I've been involved in counseling and I've been involved in ministry, it seems to me that the health of the church is directly related to the health of the families. You go to a, a congregation, and even if it's a, if it's a small congregation, but the majority of that congregation has younger people in it, that congregation has some longevity. If you go to a congregation and there's not an eclectic group of people, if it's just mostly older folks, then that congregation has lost its lifeblood. And we want to do some very serious efforts about involving everyone in not only ministering to our church family, but ministering into us as families. And that's going to be kind of our emphasis. now. Why do you talk about family ministry and, and kind of the buzzword that's been associated with us at Maysville has been family-based ministry? It's interesting to me when you look at the burden that God put on families for creating spirituality 
and for creating a relationship with Him. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, I have heard this pronounced the Shema or the Shema. That's the very first word in verse 4. Shema, hear. Listen to what Moses tells the people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be up on your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames and on the houses and on your gates. Moses delivers one of the most recognized verses in the Bible. Hear, O Israel. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Moses is telling these people there can be only one thing prominent in your life. There can be only one thing that's of central focus in your life, and that is your love for God. And then he says, and you take these commandments and you impress them, and you impress them on your children. That's interesting to me that Moses receives absolute verbal instruction from God. God will confront people and say, you look at my servant Moses. Is there any other person that I talk to as a man talks to his friend face to face? The, the rhetorical question is no. I communicate directly with Moses. And yet when it comes time to talk about impressing the law of God and the commandments on the hearts of the people, that job doesn't fall to Moses. Read Acts chapter 7 verse 22. Moses was educated in all the wisdom and learning of the Egyptians. I can't even comprehend. Moses was educated in everything the Egyptians knew. They were embalming people. Look at the pyramids. We had an, an algebra teacher in high school, and she said that the Egyptians had a formula, a mathematical formula for, for figuring out the surface area of an egg. And she challenged several of us to, to work it out. I didn't even copy it from the board. I thought my head would explode. Moses had all the knowledge of the Egyptians. And he had the direct relationship with them. If you want to talk about professional ministry in Israel, Moses is qualified. Moses is the professional minister. And yet when God said, I want your families to love me, and I want your families to know me. And I want your families to have these things on their hearts. He doesn't say, go to Moses and get it. He says, you talk to your children. And you talk about these things when you sit down. You talk about these things when you lie down. You put them on your fence post. You put them on your doorpost. Moses said the burden of people becoming what God wants them to be and having a relationship with God is on the family. It's on what we do at home. George Barna in his research on why people become and, and stay members faithful in their religious activities, he says there's three things that affect whether or not people grow up and remain faithful in the church. Number one, what happens at church. Number two, what happens at home. And number three, how influenced that person is by popular culture. Two of the three things that affect whether or not we raise a new generation of faithful people we have absolute direct control of. We control what happens at church. We control what happens at home. And if what happens at home and what happens at church mesh together, then we've got a golden opportunity to make sure that our families are healthy and our families are strong and that our families grow. Look, if you will, at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. Again, one of those very famous verses that we read. <coughs> Pardon me. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and in favor with man. Jesus grew intellectually. Jesus grew physically. Jesus grew spiritually. And Jesus grew socially. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. That verse ends... At the end of a very popular story. Jesus had been taken to Jerusalem for a, a ceremony. 
His family has stayed there, and on their way home, the, the boy Jesus becomes missing. Depending on how you read and interpret the text, he's either been missing for three days or five days. The Bible says the family went out a day's journey, realized the boy was missing. They went back a day's journey, and after three days, they found him. So you either get a day out, a day back, and then they find him on the third day, or you get a day out, a day back, and then after three days, they find him. So you have anywhere from three to five days. Where do they find him? He's sitting in the temple. What's he doing in the temple? He's talking to the teachers. He's asking them questions. He's answering them questions. And all this dynamic is going on. And, and yet when they ask him why he was missing, he says, don't you understand? I must be about my father's business. They didn't understand that he was trying to stay at the temple and go to work. He thought it was time to go to work. His parents didn't understand what he meant by those things. And so they took him from the temple back to Nazareth. Luke 2.52, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and favor with God and favor with man takes place after Jesus leaves temple. It wasn't the job of the priest. It wasn't the job of the Pharisees. It wasn't the job of the scribes. It wasn't the jobs of the Levites for Jesus to develop in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with man. It was the job of an obscure Jewish man that's never mentioned again in Scripture and possibly a 17-year-old girl. The Son of God became who He was to be. And in the intervening years before He started His personal ministry, with an uneducated, obscure, unimportant carpenter and a little Jewish girl. How important does God see families? How necessary is who you are to your children? How necessary is who we are to each other? Folks, the people that changed the world weren't educated by the professionals. The people who changed the world were brought up to be who they were by families. I couldn't help but be impressed when thinking about these thoughts tonight with Brother Gary Reeves today. All he does is be himself. There's no pretense. There's no bravado. It's almost self-deprecating some of the things he says about himself. He's living thousands of miles away, having thousands of studies a day, and he's having those studies simply because he says, hey, you want to study the Bible? What would happen if we took a simple family approach to Christianity? And if when you sat down, you talked to your children about spiritual things? If when you got up, you talked to your children about spiritual things. If you went home today and said, you know that song we sang, what, what did it mean? The songs you sing at your devotionals, what do they mean? Do you know what I learned in Bible class today? Wasn't it interesting when the preacher said this, and if we would just talk about those things, and you've heard me tell this story before about conversational spirituality. Conversational spirituality is a term that I guess coined but it came about at a camp in Gunnersville. I'd gone down there to speak at, at some thing with a bunch of folks, and I was younger. You can tell when you're younger and older and as a minister. When you're younger, they say, Now, Brother Jones, you'll be sleeping in the boys' cabin tonight. And they throw you in a cabin with a bunch of teenage boys. When you get a little older, you go speak somewhere. They go, Brother Jones, we have a private cabin for you. Those are wonderful things. Well, when you're younger and you go get in the, the cabin with the boys, the boys will, will pull pranks on you and do different things. And my strategy has always been to tie my knife in the rafters, hang it upside down so you can see it. I look around and go, now, boys, if y'all will be quiet tonight, I won't have a flashback. And I just lay back, and it's usually fairly quiet in the boys' dorms. I was this little camp in Gunnerville. Light came on beneath my bunk. Hey, Lonzo. I was still young enough people call me Lonzo. Hey, Lonzo, oh boy, here it goes. What's your favorite Bible verse? What? I rolled out of that bunk and sat down on that dirty concrete floor and a 15-year-old boy named Chad Smith said, I just like to ask everybody what their favorite Bible verse is. And a light came on over here and a light came on over here and a bunch of boys gathered up and we talked about the Bible with the same comfort and the same ease as we would talk about Raider football or NASCAR racing, or deer hunting, or whatever it was. And it was spiritual, but it was conversational. It wasn't a, let's all put on our spiritual voices and have time for Devo. 
It was a conversation about who we were, not about stuff we did. I don't know, 20 years later, that young man came through the Huntsville Police Department. I worked with him as he was a cadet. Four years after that, that young man tried out for the SWAT team, was on our sniper team. We have a fabulous, lifelong friendship because a 15-year-old kid said, hey, what's your favorite Bible verse? What would happen if the 15-year-old kids in this room could freely talk to their mom and dads about, hey, what's your favorite Bible verse? And we didn't feel awkward or we didn't feel uncomfortable. If we felt like that our Christianity was part of our family and our family was part of Christianity. The goal and the vision for family ministry at Maysville is that we become a spiritual family. That what we do in this building and who we serve in this building permeates our baseball teams and our volleyball teams and our bands and our football teams and our robotics teams and our mathematics teams and they permeate our businesses and they permeate our farms and they permeate our hobbies. And so that when you're with one of us, you can't help but know that we're Christians. And that when you visit our homes, you understand that Christianity is not just on our doors and on our windows and on our posters, but it's in our hearts. But that only happens, that only takes place when we become real. I'm assuming that is some kind of an alarm. Is that about the weather? Maybe it was somebody's cell phone. I got in trouble one time preaching too long through a storm in May, Maytown, uh, Alabama. But I preached them right through an F5 tornado. And when we left the building, there was nothing left but our building. And if they'd been on the road, we'd have been in trouble. The, the permeation of spirituality in our lives does not take place because of anything Hunter does, Tim does, or I do. The permeation of spirituality in our lives is not the burden of Carrie and Mac and Jim and Emmett. The permeation of spirituality in our lives is, is on you and your families. In the book of Nehemiah, and we'll close with this. Nehemiah has a task. He's gone to Jerusalem and he's seen what utter destruction has happened to the city of Jerusalem, his beloved city. And the wall of Jerusalem is in, is in rubble and it's been burned. And the gates have been burned. And he decides he wants to take it upon himself because he's been inspired by God to go back and rebuild that, that great wall. This is what their adversary said about them. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 11. Also our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and kill them and put an end to this work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Now why are they saying this? They're saying this because of so much rubble in their lives. Their enemy said, you look at the rubble, look at the things that surround them. Look at the, the piles of stone and all the things that are there to distract them. We'll just creep in among them. And before they even know it, we'll be on top of them. Folks, the biggest danger to the church is, is not false doctrine. The biggest danger to the church is not us leaving the, the purity of the New Testament pattern. The biggest danger to the church is us just simply being distracted us being so consumed with things and not using those things as avenues to evangelize, but they become substitutions for evangelism. That's the biggest danger to our congregation. Listen how Nehemiah addresses this problem. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 13. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall. I stationed them at the exposed places, and I posted them by families with their swords, with their spears, and with their bows. And after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Nehemiah said, you've got a mission. It's not a mission to rebuild a wall. It's a mission to provide a wall for your families. Your sons and your daughters, your wives and your brothers and your sisters. Family ministry is about us working with our family 
and our families working together to form a larger church family and that family providing a network of strength. But it's only as strong as the weakest family. It's only as active as you. Practical solutions? Make sure your children come to Bible class. Make sure your children attend the activities. The most frequent contact Hunter will have with your kids this year is Sunday morning and Wednesday night classes. When I talk to youth ministers about youth ministry, I tell them, you give me a student who's 80% regular in a Bible class and I count him as a faithful member of the church because that's where the bread and butter of youth ministry takes place is in the Bible class. And if your young people aren't attending the classes that are offered, your young people aren't as strong as they need to be. When your young people come to those classes, make sure they bring their Bibles. You make sure you come to Bible class. Bible class is the solid foundation where we build our network of, of interaction. Bible class is the place where you learn to, to get to know and to love people. Bible class is a fabric that takes us from just corporate worship to us interacting in each other's lives. In addition to our Bible class program, we have our service teams, but it's all designed to interconnect and interweave our families. And when Nehemiah decided we've got to protect our weak spots, and when Nehemiah said we've got to protect these exposed spots in the wall, Nehemiah said rather than get distracted by all the rubble, we'll make one focus, and our focus is going to be our family. See, if I'm guarding this spot, and I don't know the guy I'm guarding, it could be pretty easy to get lax. But if this is my responsibility, and if I fail in this responsibility, it affects my wife or my daughter. I'm not going to fail on that responsibility. Family ministry is about an interconnectedness of responsibility. Are you going to protect? Are you going to defend? Are you going to promote our spiritual family and protect our brothers and our sisters and our wives and our friends? Folks, family ministry is a challenge because it involves a lot of stuff. But family ministry is very easy because all it does is ask for you to do something. And when you get involved and you get active and you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and you pass that love on to other people, then the health of our church is not even a question. But you'll notice as we grow, and not maybe not just in numbers, but just in, in a qualitative strength, family ministry is about your commitment to the family of God so that your family is a family of God. Now, as we come to the close of most of our services, we always ask this question. Are you a New Testament Christian? If you're not a baptized believer, if you have not by faith in Jesus repented of your sins and confessed Him as Lord, been buried in water to rise a new life, you're not a member of the family. You may attend here on a regular basis. You may even do some stuff that we do. But if you're not a baptized believer, you're not connected to us by the blood of Christ. Second question is, if you've been baptized, are you fulfilling that obligation? If you've been immersed in the waters of baptism and risen to walk a new life, have you become a part of this family? And do you live in such a way that people who see you say, hey, this person loves God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind. If you're not a New Testament Christian, or if you've faded in your commitment as a New Testament Christian, make an investment for your soul's sake and make an investment into the family ministry at Maysville and become a strong, active part of our congregation. If you have any spiritual needs tonight, come forward while we stand and while we sing.
appreciate that lesson very much. <clears throat> we have the Lord's Supper prepared uh, this evening. If you'd like to partake of it, you can make your way to the foyer. You can be shown where you can be served. 204, 204, this song we don't sing very often, but I think it fits the comments tonight and maybe uh, leaves us with another thought or two. 204, we'll do the <clears throat> first, second, and last stanzas of that before our closing prayer. Happy the home where God is to lessons from your word. Father, we pray that we'll be strengthened from what we've had today. And we pray that you'll give us opportunity and courage to share our spiritual lives with others. And we pray that those experiences will be fruitful and that we'll give you the, the praise and the glory. Father, protect us as we go home this evening and through this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.